that be overcome. And one of the things I would suggest we do, and it's, it's to have a kind of second economic truth commission. This country, this country needs to understand where we come from and why we are in this situation. And if we do it piecemeal like we do now, it will take us another 50 years, by which time we will have had 10 Marikanas and the middle class will be part of those people who are going to be on the hill. You mentioned something, uh, Mr. Klina, there about people just wanting to be entrepreneurs even if it's not necessarily <laughs> the case or it's not going to happen for them, you know? Because be, if maybe it was given a bad name about, you, know, you go in there to be a quick deal, 25% if you are a millionaire and then suddenly you can drive a Bentley and so on. <laughs> what, in your view, could be the interventions that a funder like the IDC, with the resources to make black economic empowerment actually happen, could intervene to, to try and steer people to the right place, even if they knock on your door and say, here's a proposal, maybe somebody drafted it for them, they can't even budge on that proposal, but they want money from you. Uncle so if you allow me, um, I will respond to that, it's simple. Uh, we have a criterion, if it's not sustainable, we don't even look at it, I think that's clear. Mm. Well, I want to come back to Mr. Leroux. He is concerned about the political allocation. Mm. Um, the examples that Christo made, mm. there was extreme political allocation. Mm. That's why the whites made this progress. Mm. IDC was established in 1940 mm. by the South African government. And it played a key role in that political allocation. Some of the big industries that we have here where most of the white entrepreneurs that we find here now went there and studied there. We did a lot of research on that. Mm. So the issue of political allocation for me, it's important that it happens. Obviously we need to learn, I think the, the ministers made some points that we need to learn and we, need to, we, need to, we can't throw the baby with the bathwater. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Tirani Mabunda. I am a business person, an entrepreneur. What, what is wrong with BEE? Uh, sir, it's this obsession with buying 25% of other mm. people's yes, companies. Yes. Mm. Yes. We must start our own companies. Exactly. Exactly. Leave the white companies alone. Exactly. The problem with our country, those of us who have started our own companies are not supported even yeah. by government. We fight industries, mm. white industries, on our own. When you go to the private sector, you won't get the work. You go to government, they undercut you, they get it at 2%. By going to the in established industries? No, 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 the white companies. They still get, they still get the work in government by undercutting you. So you know where. If your friends own 25% of those companies. They will allocate the business to a company that owns 25, even where a 100% owned company, BEE, yeah. is qualified and can yeah. do that. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mamosa. Um, I think, um, you know, some things you can compare to, you know, when people like Martin Luther King, at some point, um, white people in America thought he was a terrorist until Malcolm X came along. And I think we're going to have a similar situation economically where if now we think BEE is a terrible thing, wait until you understand the aspirations of young black people. We don't want to own 25%. We want to have it all. We want 100% of our own companies. You know, we want to be able to own land. And these are aspirations that cannot be catered for by what we are discussing today. Because you need to have a fundamental systematical shift that is really not apologetic. So when the minister talks about, you know, we are not apologetic, but systematically when you look at things, our systems are very apologetic, where if a black company comes along with no white person, they think you are incapable. 18 years later, we have to acknowledge the fact that some, you know, it might be a, a, a small um, uh, population, but you have a lot of black people who've gone to the same white schools as the white children. So what makes you think that I am incapable because I'm black, and a white person who's at the same education as me is more capable. So there's a fundamental shift that needs to happen in the way we think. My name is Andrew Mitsuki. I just have a question. Uh, in principle, I believe that we agree that BEE is okay, is right, and is producing better results, though there might be challenges or certain things that need to be fixed. 
But my major question is like, how do we address uh, the issue of education that uh, my brother spoke about in terms of where someone, an individual, who have an idea that can sell, but unfortunately the person doesn't have the ability in terms of maybe education or uh, yeah, a better education in terms of maybe to put the, uh, the proposal in place and do what is required in terms of maybe the funding or in terms of him or her to get the required funds. Hi, my name is Nampundo Engla, and um, two things. I think obviously education is important, but I think it's a myth that people put out there to block um, black development. We've got a report came out saying 600,000 black graduates uh, unemployed. unemployed. Yeah. So um, they're educated, no one's employing them. The trouble right? is it looks like they, are, they, they may be graduating in the wrong things. What, likewise? <laughs> Pips, because in the economy, pips is important, but you may not be an engineer if you have pips. They're saying you have many graduates, but they're not in the right place. That's, that's absolute nonsense. I personally know a family member who's a lawyer. So not the 600. Well, fair enough. No one knows the 600. You know? But there are people, they're human beings that are standing there with degrees, and no one's employing them. Right? And secondly, I think we've, we've all got to take responsibility as the black middle class there. On, 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 on BEE. We sit here, we support white-owned businesses that refuse to change. We put our money in those businesses. Pick and pay mm. is at BE level eight. We continue to support pick and pay. Level eight. Level eight. That means they're not even trying. They are not it's attempted involved. to, they're not, they are not attempting to involve blacks. Why are we buying from pick and pay? Why? We must work with them. Oh no, well, Woolies wants us. <laughs> Why are we okay, thank you. My name is Sao Maluleke, I'm a lawyer. I just want to address some few points to the panel. I do not believe that it's correct to say BE has failed or to challenge the BE Act per se. The basis of my argument is as follows. If you believe that you have a better view or a better vision of the BE, you are sitting next to the minister, why don't you just table that instead of trying to take the system out? I'll give you an example with the government of China, or China as a whole. It did not emerge overnight. It mm. took time. As a collective, the Chinese worked together. I understand that we're coming from the past, that's a bit rough towards black people. Of course, it's not going to take two days, it's not going to take 18 years, not even 20 years to redress all the indifferences. But I invite everybody, let's just sit together, debate these things as we're doing now, but those who are opposed to BEE provide solutions, don't attack the system. Okay. Um, firstly, I would like to say to the minister, I think you are doing very well, minister, in the auditing and in the legal industry. Especially when I say in the legal industry, I mean the legal sector or the law firms, the pairing that you've actually introduced where by, I'll make an example with SAA, where um, the legal work will be given to a big law firm, like the one that I work for, but at the same time, that the f <laughs> <laughs> and then, but at the same time, what is, ambush my getting. No, but what is good is that at the same time, the big firm will be told, go and look for a small law firm downtown and partner. Or what, what is happening also currently is that the work will be given to a small firm and then the small firm is told that we understand that you might not have the capacity, but go and look for a big brother in Sentin that is going to ensure they traf uh, transfer, transfer the skills. But when it comes to education, I understand everyone here is talking about education and education. As my sister pointed out that we have a high number of graduates who are unemployed. The reason for that is this. The system itself, the way it is built, the education system, it creates employees mm. than employers. Mm. If you take, I've done this, because I, I, I go around the country actually talking to university students and, 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 and high school students. If you take 10 engineering students, you'll be lucky if you find one that is going to tell you, I want to have my own engineering company. They all want to be employed by group five, WBHO, so as accounting students, they want to be employed by the big uh, accounting uh, account. I think the education system, when you talk about the education system, you can't just say that we need to educate our people. 
the system must actually create employers than employees, not people who are going to graduate and want to work for, and want to be and want to be employed, not create employment. No, my name is Gorega. I just wanted to comment first and foremost uh, the minister on what he's done for the accounting profession. Why I say this, this is an industry that I'm obviously very passionate about because I'm a chartered accountant. It is a game changer on so many levels because historically, when it came to big audits, there's always been a case in point where the black firm partners with Big Brother. Mm. This is the first time that you find black firms taking the lead mm. on some major complex accounts such as Transnet. And that obviously takes a lot of courage of conviction. But certainly, I think that is going to go a long way in really setting up a benchmark. So from that particular angle, if you're able to obviously transform the accounting profession, the manner to which it has been done within the public sector, at some point or the other, it will start to dovetail straight through into the rest of the pri private sector, particularly the banks. The day that a black firm starts to take the lead in running a bank, then you know for a fact that this particular profession is truly transformed. But well done to the minister on that. Thank you very much. Minister, you, you've had uh, some of the views, the issue about education, issue about skills, issue about graduates languishing out there. Some, some uh, remarks before we break for dinner um, uh, would be appreciated from your, from your end. Thank you. Um, I think Jeff has addressed the issue of political allocations. Actually, I want to refute the idea that Afrikaners post the Anglo Boer War were the victims they have been painted to have been. Because after the Anglo Boer War, the Anglo Boer War resolved the native problem by uniting the two principal white groups into the establishment that led to the formation of the Union of South Africa in 1910. So they were part of the system. They benefited from the system right from the outset. The political allocation of resources for their development was part of the program to bind them into supporting the system by conceding to them material benefits so that they do not challenge the system. And in that process, the, the system alienated the, 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 the black majority by keeping them out of that system. And that is why 1912, January 8th happened, and the process is there, 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 thereafter. The second point I want to make is that icons can be wrong. I think we must not impose on our icons the responsibility to be right all the time. They can be wrong, and we must not clutch on their wrongness to justify wrong, wrong positions. We must also have the right to say, but Mr. or Madam Icon, you are wrong in this instance. The responsibility to develop black entrepreneurs requires more than a hands-off, arm's-length approach. It requires a hands-on, a hand-holding approach where you help them all the way utilizing the resources and the capacity that the state commands in the form of state-owned companies and government departments so that they are able to grow, help them with drafting business plans and a whole range of those other things which are required for them to develop successful businesses. This doesn't mean you must tolerate flippancy. But it means that you accept the responsibility that, on the one hand, not everybody is an entrepreneur. And like Jeff, that's why I'm in politics. <laughs> but on the other hand, that those who are, 
And when you can see the spark in what is, be, is before you, you must provide them with the, with the support that will make them succeed. There's a cry there, Minister, earlier on about SMME feelings, feeling that you know, government is so supporting them. You do know the issues about late payments, 200,000 businesses collapsed yes. last year just for not being paid on time by government, amongst other things. And, and that is why cabinet has taken a hardline position on the 30-day payment to, to deal exactly with those problems so that you are able to pay your SMMEs right on time. As I have said, this is a process. You don't start from the perfect position. It's out of experience that the SMMEs are being prejudiced by delayed payments that we have taken the, um, uh, uh, the tough stances that we've been taking. The president has been leading that process and, and actually calling each minister to respond. We were, we were made to submit a list to the presidency of all the procurements mm. and the, the, the periods to the national treasure and the period within which they have been paid within 30 days, within 60, within 90, and th those that fall outside that period. And those reports are being submitted to the presidency, and no minister likes the president to know the bad things we are doing, <laughs> believe me. The, the frustrations of young black people um, need to be, to be understood and tempered. They need to be understood and they also need to be tempered. Because yes, there are those that will own it all. But I don't think we need to move away from shareholding schemes in, 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 in existing institutions. To say that leave white business as white business and go establish a parallel process would be wrong. It must not be an either or. We, 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 we need to continue supporting those shareholding but we also need to increasingly support your wholly black-owned, women-owned, youth-owned enterprises. And that's why I was saying earlier, the infrastructure rollout program, the fleet procurement of our state-owned companies provides us an opportunity to establish these black-owned supplier sectors, industries, that are going to change the game in so far as economic empowerment in our country. Finally, on the issue of education, I think mistakes have been made. But again, you know, you can't cite the textbook problems in Limpopo and say, therefore, the whole education system is failing. The problem in South Africa, we invest a lot of money in education, but the quality that comes out is not to the level that we want. And there are always two parties to that fact. One is the, the, the system including the professionals who teach our children and how they are prepared. The other one is us. The question we always run away from because we are overzealous to shift responsibility is the responsibility of the parent towards the education of their children. How many of us will drop everything and attend the PTA meeting? How many of us will ask our children's teacher, how is my child progressing? We are always too busy for that. 
But we are always too eager to find someone else to blame. When we've not invested time, we throw money into the problem. I'll send my child to the best school that my, mind, that my pocket can afford, but does that educate my child? It does not. So I'm saying that in South Africa, what we need is an approach towards education which emphasizes the roles and responsibilities of everybody, including the parents, and help to change the system where it is weak. And I think the, the textbook saga in Limpopo was quite unfortunate. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that it has been attended to with, uh, with, 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 with seriousness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Christo, does any of it have resonance, really? Um, especially this whole issue about um, leaving white businesses on their own and starting off on a completely different slate. Would you share that sentiment that was raised by the gentleman there, just briefly? No, you cannot. We are part of a global world. This is the economy of this country is integrated. There's no way that you can say white, black, this and the other. Yeah. What I want to emphasize is that, you know what, I don't think there's any government in this world that has made such a lot of strides in terms of developing black entrepreneurs. Look at the amount of money that is available from the DTI, from the IDC, from the Development Bank of South Africa. Look at all the work that the private sector is putting in into enterprise development. We need to ask ourselves the question, yes. isn't it time that we take out the blinkers of our own eyes and find the opportunities and see the opportunities? Because in the absence of doing that, who comes into South Africa and identify those opportunities. Chinese, the Somalis, the Pakistanis, they come here, they are not worried about the past, yeah. right? They see tomorrow and they find those opportunities. But we forever want to complicate things in this country to the extent that we become totally lame in everything that we do. Yeah. Do you think that it, it complicates things that you've got business that may be sitting on a huge amount of capital that they are not investing in this country, yes. and they are expecting overseas investors to do that. Yeah, but that's often. Do you think that's what complicates things? That there are people amongst uh, uh, your members, for example, no, 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 no. who may not be too excited really about the e really. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, we are fully committed, and I can show fully. you my plans that we are fully committed to BE. We are fully committed to the National Development Plan. Yeah. We are fully committed. To equalize yeah. society. So what do you think informs this report that was released yesterday that things are getting worse on the employment equity front? I think we need to just just stand still for a for a minute. I think you know we to realize that so standing very still. No, no, no. <laughs> 60, remember, sixty percent of businesses in this country are still white owned. Yes. So obviously, they surely, will have, surely that must change. They will they will have white white managers appointed, right? After Secondly, twenty years, you must also realize that the average age of degreed um, black people are between 21 to 25. So As they can't find to, blacks? No, no, no. What I'm saying is experience, all of those mm. things comes into the play there. Yeah. As opposed to your white counterpart. Remember, whites are now enjoying their population dividend. In other words, the average age of white managers, 45, they're well endowed with degrees, they're well educated. So, so there's a scientific reason for that as well. Mm. Right? But, that, okay. but the Indian population is going to experience, they're already experiencing their population dividend mm. within the next five years. And you've seen it in the report. Why is that? Because of good quality education, because they have, the, uh, they have uh, they got education in, in, uh, in, in key, key, key sectors like yeah. chartered accounting, like engineers, like the medical professions, etc. Okay, so none of this sluggishness has anything to do with lack of commitment by white businesses to actually promote black people. No, no, no. I'm land. not saying that. We are the legacy of the past. So, will how remain. much of it has to do with lack of commitment? The legacy of the past will remain for us for years to come. Okay. But what I'm saying is, let's just have a balanced approach to all of yeah. these things. Let's just analyze other factors as well. What I want to want to say is, there's besides the opportunities that is created by the state and by the private sector, there's state land available. There's huge opportunities within all the sectors. We must stop looking for Excuses. the sideshows and for the excuses. Mm. 
We must get our act together. We must not marginalize the goodwill that comes from white businesses and from other sectors of society. We must unite behind a common vision mm. so that we can address the legacies of the past. Okay. I, I would argue that there isn't that community of vision, there isn't a unified vision, and that white business and white people in general do not support either the government's policies aimed at redress. And I think one of the professionals mentioned here, just something as simple, forget about selling your shares, just in terms of procurement and hiring professionals. And people have talked a lot about the minister tonight. I'm a lawyer, I was in practice until 2008. And I can't recall, I think I had one white company that gave my firm work. Very capable, corporate lawyer. No work, it's, it, there is an, a, a, a complete resistance. And the only way black professionals have grown in this country is on account of the state making a decision that it is going to have a, a affirmative procurement. So it is not correct. The main obstacle to redress is the attitude and practices of white people and white business. And you will see one of the things I mentioned and what we've experienced, even with black economic empowerment, they embrace it only to the extent that it benefits them, and in the process they frustrate and reverse those policies. So I think that's a major obstacle. I think you're right. We have to develop a unified vision, but when you have two competing interests, the interest to retain the privilege of the past mm. and the other interest to advance into the future, you mm. almost have a situation where we live in one country geographically, but we're actually two separate nations. There are instances, actually I just wanted to pick up on what Tirani was coming with, with regards to the manner in which uh, BE was implemented, which has nothing uh, to do with the logic or the, the justification for BE around the marginalization of the black owned businesses mm. is real and it's something that has happened. And in that instance, there was a, a tendency to prefer businesses that had some white component. Mm. And, uh, and you find black entrepreneurs were put in the back banner. Also, the narrative around um, access to opportunity based on the um, a political connectivity, that also had an impact uh, on the success of the BEE. The issue of the big brother, I mean, um, the, the, there's a point in which black businesses couldn't graduate. I'm sure Nongulego and others who, who, who operated in that space for a long time, where you would find, uh, I remember this one time, uh, we were developing one of the big complexes in, in Sentin. And I was made to partner with a white firm which is smaller than us. But the assumption that... Um, the, they will teach you something. Absolutely, they must teach us a thing or two. Yes. So we get together with this guy, and he wonders, why are we being the big partners to you guys? When, when they were So, he, so that, uh, that, that whole attitude around the qualification of the black people yeah. um, also does contribute Let to the Let me come in notion. there to see, Mr. In, in allocating funds for black businesses, would you say that the IDC would also look at businesses that are purely just 100% black without having to wonder whether these guys will be able to handle these billions if we give them just on their own? Does that creep in somewhere uh, because of the nature of how the economy is structured that you would always want to either have these forced marriages or not? Mr. Tabane, you don't want to force marriages when it comes to money. That's very dangerous. <laughs> when it comes to anything, that's, that's very dangerous. <laughs> In fact, what we as IDC look at is the sustainability of the project that comes. Mm. Uh, so we are very comfortable. In fact, we encourage uh, that we should fund more and more of the 100% black owned. Uh, there might be instances, as I mentioned, we are in the, as, as, as a country, we are investing a lot in the green energy space. And we know those that have technology, the majority, are largely international companies. Mm. Uh, which this brings me 